1998. Uh, my name is Des Buford, and I'm the Director of Programming and Exhibition for Frameline. And it is my privilege and honor to welcome you to this afternoon's panel, Change Makers in Conversation with Women Filmmakers. We are so pleased to have um, some incredible support today from the, uh, or rather this year, from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the fabulous folks that bring us the Oscars, the Academy. Um, they provide Frameline with a grant to um, have a special initiative um, called New Storytelling in LGBT Cinema, in which we're able to take a look back at storytelling in queer cinema, as well as uh, take a hopeful look forward as well. So this is um, our third panel in a series. We uh, previously had a panel uh, with queer documentarians, looking at how we tell our histories and how that craft has changed um, from uh, kind of a straightforward documentary to docudrama and everything in between, which was very compelling. Yesterday we had a wonderful discussion about uh, the changing modalities in distribution and digital delivery and the innovations there. And today we are, we're so thrilled to sit down and have a really fruitful conversation with some fantastic established uh, filmmaking artists as well as some new voices um, in the canon that we're, we're so thrilled to have as our guest at Frameline 38 this year. Um, I did want to um, ask everyone um, and, and really um, dedicate today's panel to um, one of our beloved filmmakers who passed away earlier this week. Um, I know uh, she was a professor to many, Alex Sechel, who uh, made, um, along with her sister, the um, landmark film All Over Me. They also uh, made one of my favorite chapters of If These Walls Could Talk To with Michelle Williams and Chloe Sevigny, um, which was extraordinary. And um, she was also a, a beloved uh, mentor and professor at uh, NYU and Columbia. So if we could dedicate today's uh, conversation to her and if I could ask everyone um, for a loving um, moment of memory so we could really hold her in the light with appreciation, that'd be great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so today we're going to sit down and, um, like I said, uh, look, look to the past and see where we've come and, and, and take a snapshot of where we're at now and where, where we hope to be going with um, four extraordinary artists. Um, I know you are all familiar with their work um, and uh, we're going to take a quick look at a sampling, um, a quick clip reel, and then they'll uh, join us on stage. Um, so let's roll the clip reel. Thank you. for joining us. So um, on the far end, we have writer, actress, producer, extraordinaire Guinevere Turner. And the very dashing writer, director, uh, Kimberly Pierce. The charming, um, as always, uh, writer, director, producer, Rose Trichet. And joining us with her first feature at Frameline 38, writer, director, actress Desiree Akavan. Yeah. Thank you all for uh, joining us for this conversation. It's an honor to share the stage with you, and I'm excited to, to have a nice visit um, along with our audience. I really hope this is the last time in my life that my face follows Boys Don't Cry as a trailer. It's a really tough act to follow. <laughs> I think it's one of the most horrifying things I've seen in my life. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if we could just kind of start off um, just kind of taking a, a, a big view, look down at, um, you know, American queer women's narrative features that have really been evolving and, 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 and changing over the past 20 years. Um, really kind of nowadays we're, we're really looking at more complicated and nuanced storytelling with emphasis on character development and depictions of intersectionalities of layered identities. I'm curious um, if you could each start off by sharing, you know, what films or filmmakers um, inspired you at the beginning of your careers that are still inspiring you today? Oh my god, I never know the answer to that question. I just was like, though, I can't think of a single movie. <laughs> Somebody else go first. 
Um, I'll say some, but it's going to be sort of a lie um, because there are people who, who influence me after, I think. Um, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of Cassavetes. I'm a huge fan of Fassbender. Um, I, uh, Midnight Cowboy was one of my favorite movies. They sh shoot horses, don't they? Um, um, uh, but I think that, uh, I, I don't know that any of those influence Go Fish. <laughs> uh, cer certainly after. Um, but. Spike Lee accused us of ripping off Do the Right Thing, but we've never seen it. Oh, we hadn't seen it? No, we t oh, she's got to have it, rather. Oh, that was absolutely a movie that I saw, and read the book, too. Uh, and it helped me. Spike Lee's books, actually, that book, she's got to have it. Spike Lee used to keep a journal of each film, and that thing helped me get through Go Fish, because almost everything that he was talking about happened. was was happening <laughs> yeah. um, to us. Um, and it was just a really wonderful document. And actually, I kind of wish there was something like that out there now. Um, that was the first and only screenplay I ever had ever read before we wrote Go Fish was um, Do the Right Thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I came at it from, um, I was an animator as a kid, so I had watched a lot of animations, and like I thought Fantasia was great, and, but I didn't know how you would translate that into something that I could do. So I ended up, I was living in Japan, and I was watching um, a lot of Japanese cinema. I mean, like you, Cassavetes was very influential. I love the neorealist, um, Akatone, um, Pasolini was great, certainly Scorsese, I mean, love Gus Van Sant. It was the, the first one was, um, what was the first one? It was the two boys, uh, Malanoche. And I think seeing those films, it was interesting because when I would see a really big film that was very finished, it was harder for me to understand how I could get the resources to do that. And so I would then think of my stories and think, oh, well, what are the ones that, that I might get my hands on? And that was, I think, for me, why the independents and the neorealists were like, oh, that's just like, you know, some people, and it's, you know, it's about gender, it's about sexuality, it's about crime. But I think it was the scale of it that really made it accessible to me. And then, in particular, Jane Campion had just released her shorts, and I think it just sent shockwaves through us. I, I, I'm going to have to jump on yeah. that one. Sweetie was a really big thing for me. Yeah. Uh, it was like, and it's a movie that if you have not seen, uh, plus her shorts, um, uh, uh, you know, definitely should see those. And the shorts make you feel empowered, right? Like that you could, oh, that she put it under her bed, and you know, I mean, it was a girl, and you know, so it was like it gave me a sense of possibility. It was like, um, what is it? Was it Precious Moms? Right. Jim Jim Jarmusch. What's his first film? I'm blanking on the title. Paradise. Stranger than Paradise. Stranger yeah. than Paradise. That one for me, I was like, wow, there, that, there's so little there that happens. It's just a couple guys having an experience with a wacky chick that they hook up with, and it's not a big story, but it's amazing and engaging and. He clearly made it for very little money. That was inspiring to me as well. Uh, Desiree, what about some of your influences? Uh, I really love the films of Noah Baumbach. I, I really like his sense of humor. I always thought they were comedies, even though I think they get mistaken for drama a lot. Uh, and I always mispronounce her name, Catherine Brilla. Brilla. Uh, the director of Fat Girl. Uh, the film Fat Girl really was a game changer for me. Uh, I love the way that she depicts sex, and uh, I think she also has a really wry, evil sense of humor that I loved a lot. Fantastic. Um, so one question that I find comes up a lot at Q and A's or after a film um, gets released is the question about you know representation, who's depicted on the screen, who's not, and um, in conversations I have with so many filmmakers, and I, I think also with some of you individually, um, there's the kind of in, inherent pressure to represent. Um, all the different diversities found within queer women's representation, gender, gender identity, sexuality, in one film. So there's, um, you know, with, with concussion or the kids are all right, um, you know, this, this sense of, oh, well, that's not my experience. Um, let's, let's talk about how, how you each manage that, that kind of pressure or feedback from trying to really serve so many different um, constituents and audiences um, really looking you know, race, gender, gender expression, and, and the grand diversity found within the LGBTQ communities and also the larger mainstream audience. I always just say the lesbians are gonna be mad at me no matter what, so I'm just gonna do it for a lot. That is true. It's worse when it's lesbians and Iranians. Like the Iranians are so much worse because there are so fewer depictions of Iranians in cinema and they're all you know, very serious female mutilation stories, or genital mutilation stories. 
and like really heart-wrenching. So when you try to make something light, everyone takes issue. And I, I'm so new to this, it's so funny to be on a panel with these three women who I've idolized for a long time. When you say like, what films influence you? It's like, of course these women's films. Like it's, 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 a, it's really surreal. So that's maybe why the cat has my tongue. But I will say that, so my work is incredibly personal and I star in this film, I don't star in my, everything else I make, but um, it's always inspired by something that happens in my life, so I don't really give a shit about representing anyone else because when you're Iranian and gay and a lady, you're like, well, what else am I gonna do? <laughs> if I were disabled, I think I would like take another box very nicely. So there's still time, but I, I don't think about that. But then, now that I'm starting to, to screen the film, it's really biting me in the ass, and I'm starting to get a little bit of the backlash, and I think, yeah, you just have to be okay with people not being satisfied, as long as the work is they're talking honest. about it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and I also think, because you're doing something personal, it really should just answer to you, and, and that should be okay. I mean, in my case, particularly with, with boys, I have fallen in love with Brandon Tina, and just been heartbroken by what happened to him, and, and I felt, wow, I can't interview him, but, so I, I, you know, I told this earlier, I traveled with Transsexual Menace, which is a group of transsexuals. I interviewed them, I interviewed all my butch lesbian friends, and we all were just conjecturing, what was Brandon's life like, what must he have wanted? And I felt, actually, in that case, I did feel in service of it, because it was somebody that I was representing that did live, but also because the community felt very protective. Of him, you know, and it was interesting. A lot of people were like, "Well, don't show him stealing, you know. Don't show there's there's no images of lesbians out there. Don't show a negative image." And I was like, "Well, it's not so much that that's a negative image. It's like if you don't show Brandon stealing, and he's just a saint, it's just going to be a bad story, right?" So it, I think there's also it's like understanding how drama works so that we can tell stories that are layered and complex and appropriate. But I think. You know, I could have done a whole different story, but I think in that case it was about trying to, to bring him to life in a way that, that felt good to the community. And that's a, that's a hard community to please, but I think if you, if you have some kind of integrity, if you're trying to do a historical figure, then you can kind of satisfy them. But they're hard critics, you well, know? When we were working on the L Word, a woman came up to me at a party and she said, I'm not telling anyone my stories ever again because every time I tell someone a story, then the next thing I know, it's on the hour. It's <laughs> <laughs> hilarious. Like, Honey, your experience just isn't that unique. <laughs> it's just 12 deck stories, and that's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the depictions are always like you're vilified or victimized. I, I mean, I think that's a specifically Middle Eastern thing, but I guess it's one or the other. And when I speak to marginalized communities, they are so protective of how they're depicted on screen because it's you're so desperate for that and you see yourself so rarely in media and it's so satisfying to see yourself in a movie or on TV. Uh, so I, I try not to think about it, but then afterwards, like the year after you make the film and you're living with it and every single day talking about it, uh, there's no solution. Like people are gonna be so horrified. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting thing, the before and after, um, the, the how you feel about your own work prior to making it, which is a whole different discussion, and, and how you feel after it's done and it's being received. And, and that, and having been making the majority of my work uh, over the past 20 years has been to, you know, a lesbian audience. And, and, and certainly, it's, it is a very tough audience. Um, Were people mad at concussion? Certainly, it's an underserved audience. So it's like, it, you know, if that's not my marriage, I would never do that. And it's like, it is a movie, it is fiction. It is like, you know, release panties, take them out of the bunch and put them back on again. It's like, it's all right. And I can't wait for the day that we get to a point where we make work and we don't think about the little voice on our shoulder that comes in right away. I mean, the L word was, was one of those uh, phenomenons that, that like, we were, you know, it, it was live that the chatter was happening. And it was one of the first times that you saw like lesbian material with, with a live chat going on. And just, and just being like, it, there are things that you strove for in telling stories that like, like, oh, we're gonna go deep here. And then people are like, more sex. That wasn't enough. Like, or that wasn't, you know, like, <laughs> you there was, be like, right, unfortunately, I think the show 
it, the show did get very influenced, and I think it was to the detriment of the show, quite honestly. I don't think that it's an open discussion about what the material should be. I'm sorry to everybody who's a, a fan and likes to you know, get online and say what something should be. I think that what we're seeing now is we're seeing auteur television, and that's where you're gravitating towards. If you want to see what the world thinks about a show, look at CSI, or look at you know, uh, um, you know, Law and Order, or or things that are that are definitely in you know you see a lot of these one hour dramas on TV, and those are definitely listening to all the chatter, and they suffer from it. That wasn't a reprimand. You should definitely give your input. <laughs> um, it, let's talk about storytelling for a, a few minutes. Um, I'm curious how you each approach your creative processes when it comes to writing, uh, direction, uh, character development. What, where do you draw your inspirations from, um, both both during the incubation process of, of creating the work and putting it to the page, and then also while you're shooting? <laughs> all right. You know we all spend our days uh, writing. Yeah, yeah we, we do. Um, I think for me it's just it's a cross between real stories and my stories. And I feel like I'm constantly looking to be moved in a way that is personal and is very intense. And I find the things that do move me have a huge autobiographical component. So in many ways, you know, I have been writing a story about a woman who passed as a man, passed as white, and passed as a southerner. Uh, she was a spy in the Civil War. And my teacher was like, you don't want to tell the story of somebody who passes to survive. You want to tell the story of somebody, and I, I apologize for the word passing is now a wrong word, but somebody who lives as a man because she's like, you want that person to do it for their identity. And so in many ways, I was really bummed that this historical thing that I was writing was dead. And it was just like by the grace of God that somebody handed me the Brandon Tina story, which was partially autobiographical insofar as I was a butch and you know my friends were transitioning and, and passing. So. For me, it was like I got to find something that existed in the world that I could fall in love with, but then I could bring my own personality to it. And I feel that happened again with my second movie, which was, you know, unfortunately my brother was fighting in Iraq and I was going to anti-war marches. And so I told a story about the soldiers that intersected with what they were going through and what I was going through. So same thing with the current projects. Thank you, Kimberly. Anyone else want to chime in about their process? It's, um, for me, it's been depending on the, the you know, one, one of the movies I did is an adaptation of a novel right now, and another is an adaptation of a life, the Betty Page story. Um, and right now, I'm actually working on a script about the Manson family, um, and specifically, I'm, I want to tell the story from the perspective of the women who followed him. And so I'm, and, but everyone just calls them the girls, and they're just interchangeable zombie cult faces, and that's really not who they were. And so for me, I'm also, it's about telling the story from a different perspective, and usually a, from a woman's perspective. Thank you, Quinn Um I think for myself, it's, it's I'm, I'm, there are, there are things, I've been trying to kind of get more toward where you are, and more towards sort of where I started in this whole thing, which is to do things which are more personal. Um, I also think it's a trap with women because I, I and we discussed this. We you know like where, where everyone. The first question in an interview is like, how autobiographical is it? If it's if it's historical, if it's something, then you can grab a distance between you and it. But it, it, there is something that there's there's like suddenly you're judged. Your film is being judged, and you're being rolled right in with it, uh, like a hostess Swiss roll, um, <laughs> let's say. And, and and I think that that's. I think it's problematic. I, I don't know why we don't have a, like a, um, you know, a, a, a distance on our work. When, when that work is a smaller film, when that work is a piece that is about things that we care about, um, because I, I, you know, I really want to have the identity of a filmmaker, but you know, we're constantly being rolled up in our narratives, uh, you know, rolled into it. With Concussion, we saw it happen. Like, you know, I, I, the number of times that people ask Stacy if she was a prostitute at one point uh, is laughable. You know, like, like how could she come up with this? Uh, what, you know, and, and, and there were times when she said, like, I have been in a marriage for 20 years. That is my house, these are my children. And, and these are the things we do economically because that's what we're kind of corralled into for the amount of money that we make movies for, which is also a large discussion. But uh, in terms of my process, I, I am getting back to that personal work I felt at like the same time knowing all these things. When we did Go Fish, I felt like we had 
a lot of work to do to prove that it wasn't just a documentary and it wasn't all that we had to say, and that it actually was a script and those people weren't necessarily all our friends and we weren't just the lesbians who were like, look at our little world, but we actually had other movies in us and other things to do. I mean, did you really feel like that afterwards? Everything on that tour that we went on, and, and that was back in the day when, you know, 20 years ago you were flown it was so funny because I couldn't make, pay my rent, but there'd be a limousine coming to pick me up, and I'd fly first class. I'd be like, "What? I'm taking this home with me, and this home with me, uh, those two tampons home with me." Uh, but you know, like, but yeah, it was a, it was everybody who every when we were in Japan, it was like it was like it was us, and they thought that it was we were the thing, and and it, and we were just like, it's not a, it's not a documentary. They're scripted, yeah. yeah. Just the, those ch it was, I felt like it was specifically because we were women. No. It still happens. Well, and then that's an interesting question. I'm tease a little out a little bit more for for Guinevere and Desiree, who um, you know work both behind the camera and in front of it. Um, you know, how often? I mean, it, it seems even at Q and A's or afterwards that you know I've witnessed people talking to both of you as as the character and not being able to differentiate that beautiful willing suspension of disbelief. <laughs> Um, let's talk a bit, I think, uh, just about uh, rolling in expectations or, or, or things like that um, in terms of working in front of the camera and challenges around that. One time a woman walked up to me at a party and said, you're a real fucking bitch, aren't you? Because of the character that I played on The L Word. And I was like, oh. you do understand that we're actors. <laughs> I'm waiting. People have said that to me before I was in my movies. <laughs> I'm waiting for that. I'll be like, I understand you better now. Yeah, I would love the excuse of saying that I was on the L word, playing a crazy person. Um, I don't have that to hold on to. I, I think there's something about cinema my, by women that feels like a diary entry. Like, how adorable that you put this together. And my film is incredibly personal, but um, it's also completely fabricated. Like, what kind of a filmmaker would I be if I had just been like, dear diary, today my girlfriend and I role played, and then she did this. And it's like, if that scene had actually happened, I mean, also, life isn't that convenient that things unfold like that. And then the minute that something personal happens, the minute you put it on paper, it's so biased. And it couldn't possibly be the way things went down. And it is part of your talent that you're able to write these things. And, and it's time to be credited for your talent. And that is why by rolling it all together, you don't. You don't get, like, you don't get kind of upheld as a filmmaker you just with a capital F. Yeah, it's like you're, a, Well, you're adorable, but I don't know, some of us, you know. Stop it. But you, <laughs> you, you bring up such a good thing, though, also, I think, you know, in, in terms of letting audiences know the filmmaking process, after Boys Don't Cry, a lot of people said, wow, well that was really easy because it was such a simple story. <laughs> and, well, and, then, and, then, and it was, well, but, and, but the thing is, at the end of the day, I think once you actually, <laughs> just like anything, it's like you work on it, you, you take out the stuff that's extraneous, you make it move, you make it work, it does just seem kind of easy, like, oh, you must have picked that up and just found it. But this wasn't that. It was like years and years, and, and it went this way and it went that way. And, and it's actually really satisfying to begin to tell people, no, let, let, let us help you understand this process because you love movies and you might as well understand the hard work that goes into it. Even today, seeing boys after many, many years, I just was like blown away by how much of themselves so many people put into that. And probably with your film too, it's like, Jesus, a movie is it's just this, you know, this, this, this combination of all these people's talents and all this work. And it is a credit, it is, it is a credit to you that, that, that and, to, and to every filmmaker up here, that, that it becomes something that looks like it's easy. That's part of what good filmmaking is. Um, but again, it, it always gets kind of, and this is, this is a bigger discussion, because I, sometimes I think like, you know, the, these are discussions about being a woman uh, in, in a business that, that is not quite friendly to women at all. Um, and I'm not up here to complain because it's going to be, it was like this when I got here, it's going to be like this when I'm dead and it's fine. It is what it is, you know, but like what can we do in our time and in our careers to, to try and change that? Make more work. I mean, I, I, you yeah. know, I've gone at this a million different directions. Sadly, the statistics got worse recently. Hey, How did that happen? Yeah. I mean, I hope you all know that it's only getting worse. It hasn't gotten better. And I know that you're going to quote some statistics now. And, and these are actually really nice because they're the gay ones. 
but you know. So, so if we if we if we go to the statistics discussion, it seems like a perfect segue to, um, you know, looking at the gender breakdown alone. If we're looking at binary gender, um, for directors of the 214 films that are screening here at Frameline 38, there's a near even gender parity in short filmmakers with 80 men and 74 women and four self-identified trans-identified folks. Um, but if we look at the features, that's where we really start to see this gap explode and um, the effects of the gender gap. So um, with all features, uh, we have 53 male uh, directors, 22 women, and uh, three trans-identified directors. With narrative specifically, we have 32 um, male feature, narrative feature directors, and 10 women narrative feature directors with one trans-identified director. And with docs, um, it's slightly better, but not much. Uh, 21 men, 12 women, and two trans-identified folks. So again, going from shorts where it's near even, and then there's a huge, huge drop off when we get to features. But um, those stats are so different and so much better. And, and you know what? I promise, like we, we are not up here to complain. I, I don't think any. I, I don't. You know, like I think it needs to not not be in that space. But 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 and again, it is not. It's not a complaint to like say what the facts are. And that that reality is actually that's that's much more even than everything in the outside world. It drops to 3%, I mean, literally. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, like, what, from your, your lived experience, your perceived experience, and I know um, Kimberly has a unique um, perspective kind of being in the studio system in, um, in Hollywood. What, what are really those obstacles? Like, let's get real. What is, what is really happening that's, that's preventing that? I, and I would love these guys, with, with their experiences, I think in the independent world, thank God, if you have a good idea and you manage to write your script, whether alone or with your friends, and you can you know, get the resources together, you can pull the labor, and I didn't really feel the effects of sexism. Maybe they existed, but I had a fantastic you know, lesbian producer, you know what I mean? I was in a very friendly environment, um, and I didn't think sexism existed, and then I graduated out of that. The reality, I think, is um, you're not, if, if you're a woman, you're not gonna get the meetings. Right, because your agency isn't gonna make as much off you, so therefore they're not gonna be pushing you. You're not gonna be getting the meeting, and even if you get the meeting, I think that there's a, a thing about like likes like. So I think that you have people, I think what you have is you, you have a lot of men hiring men because it's a very social, I mean, oddly enough, I don't think that there is enforcement of gender equality in the movie business at all because I think it's about who wants to hang out with who, and. I think that people who are like each other are hanging out with people who are like each other. And I think it's the jobs are being passed from one to the next, so not only do you have women not being hired simply because of their gender, they're not getting the skill set to be hired because of their gender. So it's like you, you're like, wait, I'll work for half the price. I mean, my fee has been cut in half for my last two movies, and the reason I took it, which was hard on us, you know, in our life, is because I knew you have to do that. And it's, you know, there's these sayings, you have to work twice as hard and make half as much, it, if not three times as hard for a third as much. And you do it because you want the experience, even when you have the experience, you don't get it. And this isn't a, a complaining session, but men will fail upwards in our business and women will succeed downwards. Yeah. I have a, a weird- uh, Is that fair? Oh, I, I, yeah. it's, it's absolutely and completely fair. I, I have a weird experience because um, since I'm a woman writer who doesn't really write women's movies, I often feel like I get plucked to write the movie because they want a woman's perspective, but I don't write chick movies, I write edgy movies. And so I, have a, I weirdly get more jobs because I'm the kind of writer that I am. Um, but I also feel like you know, they, they hired Mary Heron and I to do American Psycho because they, so then they could go, look, there's chicks in front of it, it can't be misogynist. Um, and uh, that's the same thing with the Manson family project that I'm working on now, they really, I think they were like, we want, we, we want that edgy chick, and there aren't a lot of women who are known for doing that. So I, actually, it works to my advantage, but it makes me feel a little guilty. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Rose, were you gonna say something? No, I, I, I mean, I'm not, in, I'm not in the Hollywood system. I, I, I function outside of it, and... Um, um, but maybe that's a solution. Yeah, and I would love to, you know, if this was like two panels ago, I think I would have said, yes, it's a solution. Um, we got really lucky with concussion. Um, we were able to make ourselves whole at Sundance, and, you know, sell it and get distribution. Um, and but I think 
you know, I, I think that it's a, it's a world that's that's changing. If we're truly all here, like participating in this in this audience, I think you have to start to realize that you have to pay for content. You have to stop stealing content, uh, especially small films. If you steal Batman, go ahead. I don't. I'm not going to be watching. I'm going to turn my back. But shoot, just pay the 4.99 on Netflix to or, or the or on iTunes to rent the movie. You don't even have to buy it. Don't even, you know, like, it's like, you know, it's, and that is something that, that in web series, like, you know, like, you were involved with, like, a, a great web series uh, called The Slope, and, and that was just, like, awesome. I don't know how many people have seen it, but it's great and entertaining, and, and then you don't see another season because there's not enough money to be raised, and then, because nobody's supporting it, because we all expect our content for free, and we especially prejudice our own talk about gay and lesbian work. We undervalue it. We're more likely to pay to go see, uh, you know, to go see Batman than we are to go see Lilting. Um, and, and that's really, you know, problematic. Yet, yet there's a clamoring for better and better work. If you want the work to be better, you have to support the people who you like as filmmakers and as content makers. It's as simple as that. It, so if that exists, then we are able to have careers that we, that we can maintain and pay for ourselves to live. Right now, it's like having a hobby to do independent film. Because most of the time, you lose your entire savings, and then you're forced to go into television, which is not bad if you can control the content that you're making. But that's where we have to exist. You know, we're, we're you know, it's a, it's a blue collar living at this, well. It's funny, because like a ticket right now is like a, a ballot. Like you are voting for what you think deserves to be made based on where you go for the opening weekend. Absolutely. The, the, I mean, and that's unfortunate that opening weekend has taken on so much significance because advertise you can't compete with advertising, right? So if somebody spends a ton advertising it, it does great opening weekend. It really has very little relationship to its value. But I think what you guys are getting at, which is if the independent you know audience wants films, they have to vote by going out and, and raising money and paying for them and consuming them. And, and let's tease out a little bit more, um, Rose, what you're talking about with concussion. So when it got released, it got released day and day, BOD, at the same time. And um, within, we were talking about this the other day. It was like a, within, a, within a day. Within a day, how many copies were on like the internet? 3,900 and something uh, pirated copies on the internet. So anybody could have gotten it for free. Even, it's day and day, and that's what made it that way. It's day and day, you can pull it off of iTunes and that. And I'm just wondering, like, like, you know, it's a four ninety nine price tag to rent it, to just do the right thing and rent it. And with us, you're you're literally, you know, we get paid through through number of units sold. There's VOD bumps. I'm sure that I mean, this is like the same thing for Carrie too. I'm sure. Carrie, like, it was heartbreaking on, on stop loss. My brother, who was in Iraq fighting, or I don't know where he was, but he was just like, yeah, I am watching your movie. So it was like yep. he he was watching my movie before it was or right when it was out, but not out on DVD. For Carrie, Evan, my fiance, was like, oh, it's on, the, the worst thing was it was on our own website. Somebody had posted it on the, on the Carrie website, and I called the <laughs> studio, and I'm like, we have our movie up there, and they hire people, and it's, they, they do. And so and that's another thing, you're paying you, out of any kind of commission, any, out of any money you could make, you have to hire a company that's scouring the internet to pull all the things that are being posted and on it's there. And it's whack-a-mole. It yeah. really and you, is. And you can't pull them all so off I, anyway. I spent the first two or three days of release, the only thing I was obsessed with was, oh my God, it's out there everywhere on video. I mean, sorry, on the internet. So, look, the good news is the Academy and the DGA, everybody's, everybody cares about this. This is the one thing all directors, men, women, gays, everybody goes crazy about this. I think we're doing the best we can. I think people are... We're trying to, you know, go after the companies that do this. We're trying to make it illegal, but you know, some of them are in countries that there aren't laws against it, and and I think it, that's the hard thing is what do we do? It's like the music business. It's like how, you know, it, it's and it's hard. We've all thought, how do you appeal to people to say, hey, why don't you just pay like you just did? Pay it. You know what I mean? Rather than stealing it because you're costing, you, you know, it's going to kill our business. Yeah, and Lucy Keys. Sorry, okay. I'm saying Lucy Keys the only one who did it successfully. Uh, like he put on. Uh, did anyone remember this story yeah. that he Louis put? Louis C.K. the comic. Yeah, Louis C.K. the comic. That yeah. he had a, a live show that he put on his website, and he just said, "Please don't burn this for free." <laughs> he was like, "Don't be a dick, and pay for it. It's five dollars. It's totally affordable, and it was amazing." But they, who is his? Again, who is his audience? And yeah, maybe they're more receptive to that messaging 
because they're loyal to him, because they have a certain amount of money. He's his own they're, brand. They care about him. He's their friend. He and if he has, yeah, right. and like their their friend says, don't be an asshole. Uh, and then so and, you don't and that's cool. An but the, I can just say for for my movies, I don't know. Maybe with boys, there was an ability to relate to an audience in the beginning. But you know, it's very hard to find an audience that, that wants to give you their money versus cheating. Well, and I, th I think also since distribution strategies have changed since you know uh, this year, uh, girls, uh, pardon me, Go Fish turns twenty. Uh, Boys Don't Cry it's the fifteenth anniversary, and if we look at how you know we even consume cinema, I think back then it was like, okay, how would something get pirated? Someone might sneak a camera into the yeah, actual theater, like and then there would be like you know right. it's bad VHS copies, and now you can get high res things and I think you know with Netflix and streaming and torrents there, there's a bigger sense of entitlement but I think just the, the one thing I want to conclude on upon this, this point of discussion is um, really kind of tying it together so when a film such as Concussion or Appropriate Behavior gets sold um, you know gets sold for a certain dollar amount invest, investments have to be recouped and then um, the distribution company that buys that film wants to recoup that investment when piracy happens that doesn't happen and guess what guess who doesn't get to make the next film because the investment wasn't recouped. You know, but I think that what we're doing hopefully educates audiences. Like, I know that there's a number of groups that say, hey, a woman's releasing a film, go out yeah. opening weekend. And I think it's important that we spread the message to everyday citizens. It's like, you know what, guys? Go to the theater, pay for it, or, or pay to download it. Just make sure that you're paying for this content because you will get more of it if you do that. Excellent. Um, so kind of looking at the, the whole ecosystem, if you will, of filmmaking, um, established filmmakers, festivals, uh, we touched a bit about the audience, um, but, but I'm, I'm curious, let's talk about mentoring, because um, I think, um, you know, we were talking outside and um, um, talking about how everyone um, has crewed on each other's films um, back in the 90s and who went to film school with whom, and Desiree, you said something interesting outside that you were like, I wish I had that. Yeah. Um, I missed it. <laughs> it was too late. <laughs> uh, but but I'm, I'm hoping we can talk a little about, about the mentorship and how do we put more people into the director's chair, more women into the director's chair and keep them there. How do we, how do we make that jump um, from, from shorts to features and how do, we, how do we create a sustainable ecosystem of uh, female filmmaking artists? Well, from my experience, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, from my experience, I feel like the queer community is more conducive to mentorship and uh, lending a hand to each other than others. I will say I look to Rose a lot for advice, and I don't know, I've watched you over the years, and it's really nice to know you. Uh, I went to film school, and it's so funny talking about Alex Sichel, because she was my only female directing teacher I had there. And uh, there was, I hated all the directing classes. I actually, I feel like directing is a really intangible thing that's hard to teach, <coughs> but she did an amazing job of it. And she's she just provided a lot of support and she was an ally. She was an ally to me when I didn't have any at that school. It was a weird time to be a student there. Uh, we had like a very famous person at school and it was everything was very divided and it was it was just weird and a lot of professors I think wanted to work with some of the students who were famous. <laughs> it was a weird time to be a student. Uh, but she just gave so much of herself and, and uh, was also really practical with her advice and there was something, I don't know, it was just a, a safe space, that's an obnoxious term to use, but it was a safe space and we're in a place where there wasn't a lot of safe space. It can be sometimes really cutthroat to go to film school. Uh, so that school's hell. Yeah, yeah, it can be. Uh, so I was, I was really appreciative and lucky to know her. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, the one piece of advice I would give people, it's, it's kind of along those lines, is I think learn the craft as much as you can. I was lucky that I went to Columbia and then I went to Sundance and I studied acting for, I don't know, three to four years and just really kind of drilled down on what is acting, how do you communicate to the actor, what's their experience, um, you know, studied writing for as much as I could. So I think it's, it's funny, a lot of people will come up to me and, and say, hey, will you mentor me? Hey, will you read my script? And I feel like people should take seriously, you know, that the establishment of teachers that are out there that are actually, you know, teaching and pay for it and and, do, and be disciplined because actually all the good filmmakers I know, they really know their craft. I mean, it's, you know, you have to be inspired, but you also have to really be able to, 
to turn your ideas into the writing and the directing and the, you have to be able to realize it. It seems too like you all knew each other as you were coming of age. We did. We sure into. did. That's something I'm really jealous of and I'd like to hear more of. <laughs> were there like pillow fights and like favorites? <laughs> In my head it's a lot like Little Darlings, the <laughs> camp movie. Well, Please tell me I'm right. I mean, I'll tell the PG version of it. Because there was definitely the, the non-PG version. <laughs> like the non-PG. Um, no, it was actually, we, it was a lucky time. I can just say from my standpoint, I was stuck up at Columbia, which was very straight white male. And I didn't understand how unhappy I was. Just kind of like on this weird island. And then I ended up moving down to the East Village, which um, was where the Dykes lived because the, the boys were richer and they lived in the West Village. And I got a cheap little apartment, and I knew somebody named Robin Vockel, who ran the New York Gay and Lesbian Film Festival. And all of a sudden, I just started riding my bike from, well, before I moved, riding my bike down and just going to the festival. And I couldn't believe there was gay stuff in the theater. I really had that very obvious moment of kind of coming out into the culture. Met Robin. I think you guys kind of appeared on the scene right around then. You. No, but I knew Robin before you were dating her. I knew you, you were going to say that to the mic. Yeah. So then, then Rose, so I, I knew Robin, but then and then I dated Nicole, and then Rose showed up, and she was dating. I mean, it really was like that go-fish moment. Who do I date? <laughs> we can welcome you in now that we're, we're really old. You can be a part of our club now that it's no longer hip. But, but it was, and it, and it really was. I mean, again, this was my recall that, you know, there was a summer beach house that everybody went to that you and Robin had. Yeah, we rented. <laughs> and that was one place in the wrong time. Well, I, I had rented a summer like beach house. You had rented a summer beach house, and everybody, every lesbian occupied it. And uh, you were working with Lori Weeks in yes. the backyard yes. uh, on Boys Don't Cry. Lisa Chilodenko was uh, very hush hush about high art, yes. but they were like in the kitchen, and she was uh, she was with a. Uh, a woman, uh, what Cheryl was a very amazing cook and would go like at fish heads and make us like amazing food and like, and uh, and and I was working on my second film, which was Better in Hall Hallways, uh, right. sort of remotely, and uh, that's was I and there was for a high lot art. of uh, I auditioned for High Art, and years later, and obviously I didn't get the part. Years <laughs> later, um, Lisa Chodenko told me there was no way I was ever going to hire you. She's like, I didn't want anything to do with Go Fish. I didn't want my film to be associated with you guys. I was like, why did you let me come and audition? That's so mean. Wow. And so it's interesting that like, that to her, we, the stink of Go Fish was not what she wanted her movie associated with. It's not the stink, maybe the shadow. Maybe the crippling expectations. It was, it was really such a interesting because she never let me read uh, High Art. Um, so I never I never participated in, I mean, we had that summer home and, and I had, I had, um, she did a film called Dinner Party, a short film that I had gone and like, you know, kind of gave notes on an edit and things like that. So we had, you know, we had had that relationship, but high art was definitely something that she really kept to, to herself. I, here's a very lesbian thing that happened to I me I love once. that movie, by the way. I was uh, a very <laughs> lesbian thing. Uh, in the 90s, I was in a music video that was a Melissa Etheridge cover of a jo Joan Armour trading song directed by Maria Magenti. And Lisa Chilodeco was the AC. Wow. That's you less. get the award for <laughs> deepest Les trivia. <laughs> Thank you, Guinevere. Um, but I'm, it was a good, I think it was a really fruitful, you know what I mean? It was, a, it was a great time because not only were we all making films, but our friends were making art, you know what I mean? They were, like, there was always a show. I mean, the shows went up and down. Some of them were, like, fantastic, like what Nicole, you know, was doing and what Zoe Leonard was doing. And then others were just like, hey, there's a show, and we would all just go yeah. or we would be at a club I mean it was an amazing time because it was like oh we're all going to go to this club and it was just like you just showed up you know what I mean I, I mean for me I, I this is something that I believed in since then and I believe in now and I continue to live my life in that way um, uh, um you know and I think I think I think a number of us do I know Gwen does is a mentor to many people I am um I, I work through several organizations um do not just the Sundance Labs, but also uh, I just w had the pleasure of doing the the, the Outfest um, mentorship program this year, which was amazing. Um, which I've been doing for 11, 11 years. years. Oh, which means um, there's like 55 people out there who, at one point, have gotten advice from me. Yeah, and it was super gratifying. And then and then I work with Queer Art Mentorship in New York, uh, which is Iris Sachs's organization, which is fantastic, and he's amazing. And I can never believe how much he does for the community, and you should support him. 
just endlessly. Yeah, just real quick, he was another professor I had at NYU uh, right after Alex, and he was the reason the slope happened, the web series that I did. Uh, it was in his class that I made it, and getting his encouragement and having the freedom to do whatever I wanted to do was yeah, totally if there are good. gay, like, angel wings, he's, yes. he should, <laughs> he's so pop, generous pop with on. his time yeah. Yeah, and his support. And um, Kimberly, um, I remember you, you and Jamie Babbitt are also now doing mentoring through the AFI uh, directing workshop. Yes, I do a lot for Sundance because I'm so appreciative and I think everybody should support them. They're, they're great. But I also, uh, I taught a class at AFI and I did their keynote speech and I think we're all pretty non-denominational, you know what I mean? It's just like people ask and we, we try to give as much as we can and I, I would encourage people to, to give back as well because it's, that's how we all became what we are, you know. So it's uh, it was great. We had a great time. It was the women's directing workshop, and I think it's the only one in the country that focuses just on women directors, and it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's and it turned 40 this year. It turned 40. No, it just keeps rejecting me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to change that. We're going to get you in. Um, I'm curious um, if you could each share or just, um, you know, ruminate on what have been really um, some of the, the key successes um, to telling the stories that you've wanted to tell. Like, what, what, have, what has made that happen other than, I think, you know, finding the right investors, Kimberly talked about, you know, having the right script and the right, the right team to, to make that happen, but like, what, what have really been some of the other key factors in, in manifesting on that vision? I mean, for me, it's, I, I always think we're lucky if we have any talent. Um, we're lucky, you know, if we pick the right project, which, you know, we do and don't do. And then I think on top of all of that, it really is this insane level of persistence. Like if I look at Boys Don't Cry, it, it, I mean, of course I had all that other stuff, you know what I mean, that I got, but it was just like it was relentless and relentless and relentless and we would start to make the movie because it's the only way to make an independent film, you have to commit to making it and it would fall apart and I'd lose my job. But if I look back retrospectively, if I had given up at any of those times when it fell apart, it just would not exist. And so for me, I think it's, you have to assume you're, you're gonna have the talent and gonna have the money and gonna bring in the people, and then you have to be relentless and you have to win people over. Like if I look at the series of people that helped me, Christine Vachon, I believe Voice on Cry would not exist if I had not met her and if she had not been supportive and that you may have been instrumental in that. Um, Sundance, I don't think the movie would exist if they hadn't had me to their labs and I got to make scenes that didn't work and learn from it. And the other thing I would say is, be your own hardest critic. You know what I mean? Like learn how to, I think the biggest thing I learned in art school was how to take criticism. It was like listening to people, okay, that person is competitive and they're an idiot, right? Because you're gonna have that. But oh my God, these three people said that this scene is too long. They're right, cut it. You know, they, these people said this doesn't, doesn't belong. Cut it, like just learn to really see the path clearly. It's also about setting an expectation and, and, and I, I hope I'm not revealing too much by but with Boys Don't Cry, you started to make it as a short film. You made a you made a short version, which is the version that Christine saw. Like you know, but it was it was really kind of like, and there's my friends. Some of my friends are playing parts, and some you know, and and yeah, and it was this big. But it's it's also like setting an expectation, and this happened with Concussion as well. It's like it's like it's great to make films out of a community and just hire your friends. But you know what? Like you can set the bar a little higher. And, and know that you have good material and let the material find actors for you, like actors that you might be perhaps intimidated to work with. Like it's time, like we have to kind of get, we have to kind of put on our big girl panties too and like be like, you know, second panty reference. But you know, and be, and, yeah, the third one, the third one's gonna be just mine. Uh, but, and, and just be, kind of brave about these things. I think often, and I see it with students as well, like often students will work with, you know, people younger than them or like, you know, and it's like, and I'm like, aren't they supposed to be like 35? Why is someone who's like 20 playing the part? Because they're, 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 they get a little intimidated. And it's like, it's like really kind of like, I think that one of the funny things about directing, and, and perhaps you never went through it, but I, I go through it like all the time, which is it's like, you always feel kind of a little bit like you're faking it. Um, you know, and that you have to just get rid of. You are a director. You get on set, and you and you and you prep your movie like a director. You write your movie like a director. If that, if you're a writer director, you, you everything moves towards that, and you don't question that. See, that's a real mentality shift, and that's what enabled me to move forward. 
So before I made the web series, I feel like, and especially just now finishing film school, I just graduated like a month ago. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> the diploma means nothing. Don't applaud me. It's just going in the trash. Uh, $200,000 trash <laughs> piece. Uh, but before then, and I'm watching my classmates now, it's not like I put in less effort. It's not like I wasn't hustling and working hard. I was probably working harder, but my energies were so inefficient. I was putting my energy into the wrong things, and I feel like I was trying to match this view of success that was like very narrow. What's the wrong thing? Well, here's the thing, actually, the things you were listing, like you got the Sundance Labs and all these other things, like I didn't, like I kept failing. And I didn't get them when I was in school. I found, mm -hmm. I mean, it, believe me, it took a long time. Like it, yeah. But I, there was failures and then successes, but equal failures with the successes. Yeah. And I, I always think, you learn so much, yeah. and also I just don't think you, you, have, you, you have to understand that, that failure doesn't necessarily mean that you're not good. It just might be your time to fail. Yeah. But also I you think know? I was imitating a style that wasn't even me. And like well, asking, then that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. I think I like had to find my voice and like asking, it's so funny because it's like asking actors who are out of my league. That was actually a bad thing for me. And once I actually, my girlfriend and I were like, let's just start it ourselves. Then we made something, but that was our aesthetic and our voice. And that was the way the comedy worked better. Uh, I kept aiming for this other thing outside myself that I could imitate. And I was like, well, Middle Eastern stories are more serious. So let me make a more serious film. And that wasn't, that wasn't me, and it wasn't until like you know I sh blew my wad on a really expensive 16 millimeter short that got in nowhere, and I felt like you know I was exhausted from having made this thing that I thought was so beautifully crafted uh, that I gave up, and I was I was in Iris class, and I was like, well, let me just try to make something funny, let me just try to slap something together in a few hours, and that's when things started to cook for me, and I stopped giving a shit about what was the right kind of film to make and what was the film that was gonna garner the most respect or what was I reading about in magazines. And, and perhaps that's it, perhaps that's the key, to not give a shit. No. Um, because what happens, I think, and particularly also for us as women and for those of us applying for grants, applying for, we're applying towards a niche what they want us to be. So if it's gonna be Middle Eastern, it's gotta be, I remember like Shireen when she was doing like, you know, Enrica, and it's just like, there's no bomb that goes off. Stop asking for it. Stop wanting it. It's not gonna happen in this film. And you know, like, and, and just being, you know, kind of living with someone who was just mad about that all the time. And it's just like, and, 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 and you know, and, 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 and she was great, she didn't do it, but it's like, there's an expectation out there. And if you fulfill that expectation, perhaps then you'll get the grant. Perhaps then you'll get the money and the acceptance. And it's like, and it's a trap. It really is. Yeah, get expectations too. That this is the coming out narrative. This is the style of comedy we like. This is the style of drama that's appropriate. But you can dictate, I mean, I think you have to teach an audience how to view your film. And you have to sort of set the bar for what you think, like I think we're with each film, you sort of reinvent the wheel. The how, wheel. How, do you feel like you, how, how do you feel like you 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 can teach an audience to watch, to take your work in? I, I mean, now that we're in a time of branding ourselves and you know getting back to Lucy K thing, how do you how does one? I don't know um, branding wise. My film hasn't sold yet, and I'm figuring out how. I mean, we're we're discussing the marketing for it right now. So <laughs> tangibly, like I don't know at all, and I'm probably the worst person to be talking about this. I just mean like artistically with the film itself. I think the film takes chances and is not your classic comedy or your classic <laughs> gay film, and that if you sit through it, it totally shifts. Uh, but I have no idea how to sell or monetize that. By the way, it's such a great film. Thanks. It's one of my favorites from Sundance this year. It's so good. I love that. And it, it's screening uh, tomorrow night at 7 at the Castro. You're all invited. It's fantastic. Also one of my favorites. Um, so talking about kind of the, the shift you had or this moment of like, oh, this is what I've been doing. This is what I need to be doing. Um, what are the stories you're all excited about telling going forward? Where where, where do you want to put your energies next? Um, I mean, I know you talked about uh, the Manson project, but in terms of really, if, if you're able to green light your, whatever you want, what, what are those films? I am. Um, so I just did it. Uh, Indiegogo campaign for a feature that I wrote called Creeps, which is the story that I want to tell, sort of keeping Go Fish in mind and what our agenda was there, which was we're normal, we're just like everybody else, we're, we're nice people and we have our little relationship dramas and 
And now I'm like, have we granted enough so that my two main characters can be assholes? <laughs> gay, mean, snotty, asshole, um, a gay man and a lesbian, and that's, and that's sort of, I, I, I felt like, I, I, I tested the waters a little about trying to raise money, and I felt like if these were nicer characters, people would have given more money. Which is interesting, but I still think gay assholes is the way of the future. Thank you. <laughs> yes, well, my gay asshole movie. Um, I have kind of two routes that I'm going in, and, and one is sort of getting back to the Boys Don't Cry vibe and feel, and it's a, uh, I studied with Paul Schrader, and he said you need 10, 10 years distance on anything. If you're gonna write something, uh, personal because you actually want to be able to transform it. So I have a story that I've been living with for many, many years. But the very short version is uh, my father is a, was a great, great con artist. He was one of the most charismatic guys I ever met. And my parents had me at 15 and 16. And he lived this incredibly wild life and disappeared. And eventually we, it, it's the challenge of it, what would happen if a con artist came back into your life and wanted to take over. And it's, it's kind of a love story. Uh, with him. So uh, I'm writing that and I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And I'm also doing, that's what I'm here, uh, trying to get the life rights to a really exciting civil rights story um, that I'm going to do for television. And it's interesting, I met with the rights holder today and the person it's about always had a fantasy that it would be a movie. Um, and, you know, I actually, before I even approached the person, and there's like three main characters, you know, kind of went through it in my mind, and I was like, look, I love film, I would love to do that, but the truth is, right now, in television, if you can expand it out to six, eight, ten hours, you can have, you know, three different characters each have an arc, and you can really show an era, chances are it's probably gonna see the light of day more likely than if you go down the film road. And while heartbreaking, we have to be realistic, because I think, you know, content is king. I just love stories, so. It'll pay me better? Yeah. Okay. To a limited series, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, I, uh, I'm working on uh, a film called uh, When You Drink Beer for Breakfast, um, which uh, that probably says it all. Um, uh, and I'm working on a, um, I'm working on another. It's it's very it's very interesting because it's like it really is about what do you pick first, and you really. Part of my advice always to people is to look at the market and, and try to be smart about what it is you're making. Like, don't be like, you know, there is the, like, fuck it all, I'll make whatever I want, but there is, like, sitting there with your film that, you know, you, you, you don't know what to do with as well. So if you can identify, you know, what is, what is more likely to have, have a life, um, um, then, you know, so that's, I'm battling with that a little bit because uh, it's, it's like I've given both piece of, pieces of advice. And so now in my own life, I'm like, do I do the one that I feel like is more commercial, which is this um, uh, thing? Do the, do the it's one still actually more. neither are commercial, by the way. It's the one that's like that much more commercial because uh, it has a male lead. But don't you think, like I look at Boys Don't Cry, which was the most uncommercial idea in the world. I think Go Fish, before it was successful, didn't seem commercial. But I think if, if you, you make it commercial by making it full of life and have a power and then it... I also think there's, I, I, I kind of, I, I agree, I absolutely agree, but I think there, are, there, are, there, there is an element of chance to it as well, sure. which is, which is what, what, at a moment when something hits the scene, I don't think that Go Fish could translate in a different year. I don't know what it was about. I don't know if it was, if it, you know, I, I don't know why it, it, it hit in that particular moment. It's the first of its kind, too. Yeah, but I think it, it would have hit. It wasn't. That, that people say that about Go Fish, but it wasn't. There were really great films prior to it. Um, and it wasn't, but there were a lot of things that we, you know, and, and, and that, that, that were original about it. And certainly I was approaching it in a, in a, I was an experimental filmmaker and I wanted to bring that to it and like blah, 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 blah. But, you know, but that should have made it less commercial. Um, but it remains the film that I think has made the most money that I've, that I've made. Um, at, so. I venture to say that if it hadn't come out that year, but nothing else, but it, then it would have come out the next year or the next year, because I still watch it, and what you feel is it's full of love and personality, and it, it, you can feel it's alive. It has its own organic presence, so I think it would have, uh, that would be my venture, is that even had you made it a few years later, 
it's a special, alive thing, and I would try to breathe life into the thing. I mean, I, I do, yeah. I mean, I just always have this kind of yeah. thing in my head where, where I feel like I feel like it's it, the timing is everything, and timing is something are. that you can't always control. Mm -hmm. And I've seen amazingly beautiful films not catch, and I just sit there and I wonder why. You know how many gorgeous films are just out there not being seen, like a gigantic pile of them. Um, so you know, like I, I think that there is there is a little bit of luck to the whole thing. Um, and does uh, for I you? I want to know what the other idea is. <laughs> What's the commercial? Oh, look at the Jesus uh, bubbly. I'm mm -hmm. sort of fascinated with Jesus and religion. I grew up very religious, and it's about a man who's born again. Um, and oh my God, it sounds so boring. Maybe I'll do the other one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he used to be a blackout alcoholic. Both of them have like drinking in them. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, does yeah. the stories you're excited to tell? So uh, I just wrote a pilot, and it's funny. So living with this first feature post Sundance, uh, it has been. It's sort of this is the first time I've had a view of the climate and seeing what a f an indie film can do, made at this level, and how much it could potentially recoup and how to live a life. And I still don't know how people live a life. I'd like to talk to you. They about. don't. They, they don't. don't. They don't. No, it really is like a, a trophy job. percent. If if women are working three percent of the time in features, that's not even a hobby. I mean, that's that's not a career. I mean, that's not a life. So you, yeah. it, I think that's the big challenge that we're up against. Is how do we actually make work and actually survive and have it be sustainable? And it, it's television. Yeah. It's television. Yeah. yeah. Which I mean, is fine. I, I love TV. Uh, I've always wanted to make television. So uh, I wrote this pilot, it's a bisexual dating comedy, and it's, I've always wanted to make something like this, so that's one project. But I have a feature that I wrote many years ago, it's the first film I ever wrote, and it's, uh, it's sort of like a female-driven Rushmore, uh, about a, a comedy about a 15-year-old um, girl who develops like an unhealthy attachment to her acting teacher. It's like a revenge comedy. So I really well, I want to know, because I have a, a butch femme romantic sex comedy that, that yeah, actually, but. that I sold to the studio, so, because there was a moment when they thought that was super commercial, but then when it really went down the road because they were bought by GE. Oh. Well, no, but, and it made sense. They just were like, look, this is just too out there for us. But I was like, but out there makes money. So I feel like it's time will come. But doesn't GE make vibrators? Can you say that into the microphone? Because the washing machine doesn't count. Yeah. Use your mic. Use your mic. Well, that's true. Maybe that's the. I can go back with that, right? Yeah. Right. You're like, I got this angle on. This. Yeah, it's gonna make some money now. Well, I, I just say I think someone should really cast Owen Wilson as a butch lesbian, and then I don't know what it How come there's never been a, a, a cis man playing a butch lesbian? How come no one's ever done that in movies? I think that would be really fun. It's weird. Bruce Jenner. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Al Franken as a lesbian. That's like my kind of kind of like risque casting. There's a really great website called uh, Men Who Look Like Old Lesbians dot com, and I spent like a fair amount of my early twenties on it. So <laughs> anybody wants to check? Yes. Yes. Um, so we're gonna open it up to questions for our audience. I know um, things have been percolating, so. If, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we don't have a mic for you, but I'm happy to repeat your inquiries or comments. And then there was silence. What a loud audience. For those of you who have been sleeping, it's yes. time to wake up and ask a question. <laughs> Hello, Candace. Um, can you speak to, again, making a living outside, in, in filmmaking? You talked about TV as being the, the route. Can you speak to other ways besides TV in terms of just trying to get things funded? So the question is, can you speak to a living of making a, a career and a living as an indie filmmaker? Uh, we talked about, you, you all talked about TV as an option. What are some of the other outlets or paths that you would suggest? I mean, you can do grants, but grants are, I mean, like I got a NIFA grant and while I really appreciated it, I mean, at the end of the day, that's a lot of work yeah. to get very little money. So it wasn't really a viable way to live. I no, think it'll get you a little bump along. Like Shireen's got every single gram. Like, like, but yeah. it'll get you a little bump along the way. But it's not. It's yeah. not. I was gonna say that you could probably speak to this more than any of us because you have done so many. Like writing seems to be the thing. Yeah, you can I mean, write. Do it. The, the the golden age sort of ended in two thousand eight. But I mean, it used to be 
I would write, write movies for a lifetime that they would never make. They just had so much money that they would just pay them, you know, just an adaptation of a young adult novel or, you know, two life story. I've written so many scripts for a lifetime and Oxygen back when it had um, original programming. Uh, and uh, it's a little, that's actually a little depressing because I'm, you know, because it's hard to write a script and it takes a lot of time. And even if it's something that is just a job, it's still, I put myself into it. And then they're literally lifetime probably paid me to write four or five different scripts that they never made. Not, and not because the scripts weren't good, just because, like, one was what about this, these gay kids in Orange County, and the, when I turned my script in, they also had someone writing a script about the beginning of P-Flag, and they were like, well, we got Sigourney Weaver to play the woman who invented P-Flag, so that's our gay thing for this year, so we're just gonna shelve that. And it's, I, I don't own it either, so. But, so, but it is definitely how I've survived over the years. I, I mean, I can say for myself, I, 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 I would not, I don't think have anything if it wasn't for television. So I've done 23 hours of television and that keeps on giving. And if I had, if it was just the money that I had made doing films, oh no. Uh, oh, except for concussion, weirdly. But you know, like, mm -mm, that would not be, uh, I, I'd be a, a super duper in the hole. And I not think in the a other, good way. And I think the other thing is if you want to get people to pay for your, for your work, you have to upfront invest a bunch of time developing it, and that's something to really learn. Like, so now I used to develop for for film, and so now I'm developing for television. So, for instance, like my civil rights project, you know, it took uh, a number of months of reading all these original books and coming up with a pitch. And then I walked, you know, into the studio actually yesterday, and you know, pitched to the, the head of the studio. But it's there's a lot of upfront investment, and you know, it doesn't mean you're going to get to make it. But that is the one, that's the only way through that, that needle. Yeah. Yeah, I've pitched five shows. I, I've pitched five shows. Um, and is that worth the time? We sold, oh, no, because we, we got a deal with one and then, uh, but, but for other people it really is. For other people that have been much more successful than I have. I, I've loved all the things that I've pitched. Would you pick, would you keep pitching? Like what's your feeling gonna, about it? Yeah. yeah. You just have to keep on going. Who said the thing about trying again? Someone said that. Was about it what? On this panel. Or was it one of you guys? You yeah, no, China I think again. I said, yeah, you gotta, yeah be very happy with you. Just keep going. Just you, yeah. you get down, you get back up. You get down, I, you get yeah. back up. It's, I have pitched things that I thought, like, this is a no freaking brainer. Are well, you my, kidding me? Like, that thing got on the air, and this is not getting on the air? <laughs> like, this is so funny, and this has to do with this, this, and that. And, you know, and, uh, you know, but you just, I, you, I gotta keep going. Yeah, we're doing another, going into pitch another show. And you guys are talking about pitching at the same time. There's, you know, we have colleagues that are that are doing really wonderful work, um, directing episodic television. Jamie Babbitt has been able to kind of go back and forth. You name the television show, she's directed it, and she's still continuing to make independent features and mentoring. So that's she's like one of like a handful, and there are only a handful of women who have gotten who have careers directing. Leslie Lika Glotter, like uh, like like the woman who did all the How I Met Your Mother, um, you know. I mean, but Jane, you know, like there's not there's not a you know there's not a gigantic. There's probably like five. Yeah, there's there, not a gigantic. That, that are I was working gonna, more like ten, but yeah. Oh, maybe yeah. it is ten. But the you know the one who did also Breaking Bad and she did some Game of Thrones, Michelle. What? No, there's a one woman. There's one. <laughs> I thought Game of Thrones was a glass ceiling on women. It is. There was a single there's note. one woman. Yeah. Michelle something. I don't know. I pointed it out when we watched it. Someone get your phone out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's hard because and also if you think about Jamie, I mean, you know, Jamie's been doing it a long time. She you has. have to be you have to do it a long time to keep doing it. You know, and it's very for me the bizarre thing is when I'm like, I just want to direct episodic. They're like, Don't you want to create shows? I'm like, Well sure, but I just want to direct episodic. Like I just want to be told go do that thing, but then they come to you and you're like, Oh, it's so you know It's super hard to break it episodic. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I just got done with that MTV show, and I'm like, why is my career sort of backwards? I started at HBO. I didn't. I wish it was. Yeah, I, I love that show. I really love it. It's a good show. What show uh, is it? No, it's another show. It's a new one coming out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but you know, like I'm just like, how did I start at HBO and now I'm at MTV? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Back and forth. Oh, back and forth. Back and forth. It's weird and cyclical. It's just so funny that there's no other job where you just like have to work on spec for years of your life. That I really thought that there would be a moment where I made it and everything would shift. And it's not the case at all. Like you and like you said about failure and you've said about like you're gonna hear no. Even after that breakthrough, like I really thought 
I didn't think my life, when I got into Sundance, I wasn't like, that's it, next up, Hollywood. Like, I was like, okay, realistically speaking, this is still gonna be an upward climb, but I didn't, I didn't know that I would face so many more no's and that I'd keep having to reconvince myself that this was what I was meant to do and this is what I'm fighting to do and it's the same effort I put into financing the film and getting it made and that's fine, that's the lifestyle, but you really commit to it and you are the one who drags it. Like no one's gonna hand, no one's gonna be like, I think people could tell you like, this is amazing, you're amazing, and more pe people who tell you that are usually like totally not gonna take any action, the ones who blow the, blow the most smoke up your ass. But like it's a daily grind of being like reconfirming in your head why you want to do this and why you're driven to and what the practical steps are for it. Uh, it and I and it's so amazing hearing you guys talk because I don't think it gets easier; it gets more interesting. And yeah. but I always find if you can create content, mm -hmm. right? If you can initiate that script, if you can co-write that script, if you can shoot that thing, I've always found at least that's the. You know what I mean? You have to be very careful in Hollywood about taking too many meetings. You know what I mean? I just think it, it can kill you, but I think every time I've created something, it's gone somewhere. It may not have been gone where that first one went, but they go places, you know? And that was the, like, the one piece of advice I ever have for anyone is like, you have to enable yourself to do it. <coughs> that I kept, and I think that's the difference of what I meant earlier, of like, the grants and all that. It's like I was looking to outside forces to say like, you're a filmmaker, go for it. All I needed to do was tell myself, and it was, you know, an emotional journey I went on after that 16 millimeter film that cost so much, that I, I just said, I'm gonna do this the way that I wanna do it, and no one has to give me a, a sticker to say and, good job. And I think the good news is, at least this has been my experience, you know, we all read a lot of really bad stuff, and I do think that, like, you guys had Go Fish, and it was, you know, you can just feel it's alive. You know, you had your movie, I had my movie, I do think if you believe in something and you love it, yeah. it, it will live. And if you bring it to life, people will join in because they're desperate for something that's any good. Because there's enough stupid stuff out there. So that's the thing, is you have the power to birth something. And once you start birthing it, it'll grow. I recently so I pitched a show that has deaf characters, um, and the main character is a sign interpreter. And uh, I, was, I pitched it a couple places, and you can see people being like, who's going to go see deaf people on TV? And so finally, I, I like to come up with a good tagline that makes people uncomfortable. So I said, you know what? Deaf is the new gay. There's tons of gay people on TV. Nobody cares anymore. we got to find a new community. Didn't, and they were like looking at me like, is that really offensive to gay people and deaf people? <laughs> and did you end up moving forward with it? Uh, yeah, actually, that, I got an offer on that one. So there you go. Awesome. Deaf is the new gay. You just need a log line. Yeah. <laughs> but I do really think it's like, it's about what, what compels you. I mean, I, I agree. It's what, what compels you to want to be a filmmaker or to want to be a storyteller in whatever platform it is. I, I, I've been working, I'm doing also doing another thing with ITBS where I'm doing like this experimental narrative with a number of different filmmakers and exquisite corpse that uh, a number of filmmakers make together. And and I and I you know and I did a I did a short that's in the festival that's playing here I think at, tonight at, tonight at, at, at the seven o'clock show and I and I think it's like I, I at this point I'm just like I'm just like I love all parts of it I am not too good to not do web I'm not too I I mean I'm, I'm so excited by all the different platforms and the places that we have to tell stories and but the the issue is is like do you have just one good story or are you a person filled with like the compulsion to want to tell stories and, and, and to get them out there. And I think that that's what drives you. That's without the money, without all of it, there are times when we're broke ass, you know, Rose, and what's your movie called? still going. What's your movie called that you have here? Mine? No, oh, Rose. Oh, Elliot King is third. Um, Just wanted everybody to know that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question, Candace. I think I saw another hand. Yes, hello. Is that me? Yes, you. Hello. Um, Given the difficulties in, in um, financing movies, do you think there's a certain amount of class privilege involved in being able to make them? And do you think that that affects the kind of movies that get made? Uh, the question was, uh, given the challenges in financing, do you think there's a certain class privilege in what gets financed? And um, what was the second part? Uh, does it affect what gets made? Does it affect what gets made? Thank you, yes. Well, I mean, there's. It's, that would be in everything, right? So, but certainly it affects what gets made. But then you have to say to yourself, well, if that, it is true, but then how do it, any, you know, black films or any gay films, how did they ever get made in the day when our class privilege, you know, was down here? So again, I think it's the persistence of, you write a great script or you have a great story to tell, 
I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. I'm not going to say you're going to overcome all the straight white privilege, but it, it can be done. And that to me is the miracle that we all got to make our films given where we were coming from. We were completely disempowered in, in a lot of ways, but the story was our power. I'll just say coming out of film school, uh, the people I know who, I mean, we're all in amazing, most of us are in a lot of debt, but it's very clear to me now the year afterwards who's full-time working on their feature and who's working nine to five or, you know, <laughs> like eight to midnight editing uh, stupid commercials uh, to try to make ends meet. We're all hustling, but it's really clear where the class divide is. And where is it? I mean, the, the rich kids with trust funds are making films. And the people I know in the indie world in New York who are still working are either independently wealthy or uh, make commercials to sustain themselves. And are the rich kids making movies that are working? I don't know yet, actually. They haven't been finished. Well, that'll be interesting <laughs> to look retrospectively back. Which stories actually yeah, sustain themselves? Yeah, we're, we're any good. It's, it's really strange, but I've noticed, and I was lucky enough to pair up with uh, my producer and the company that financed the film. Is they're independently wealthy people. I mean, they, and they appealed, the, the funding was raised through private equity in the UK. I, wasn't involved in that process very much, and I got really lucky. Uh, but I'm on a very special diet right now. I'm eating free food at festivals. <laughs> lost a lot of weight. It's, it's, yeah, it's just a crazy year. It's just a year of just like, not just supporting yourself with nothing, and just moving from festival to festival. I, I'd also throw in there just- place. Yeah, rent out my place. My While you're living there. Oh, kick her out. No. Is that what no, no, I just was going to say, because they're, you know, asking about how to get money. I mean, the other thing is, you know, obviously episodic, obviously selling stuff. You can write, which is great. You know, I'll do speaking gigs, and that brings in, you know, not enough, but a little bit. Yeah, and I feel like you become too. really entrepreneurial. You know, you're just like, I, you're in the entertainment business. Entertain. Yeah, if I mean, like, get on that stage and dance. <laughs> if I hadn't made the web series for nothing, and proven myself with that, then I wouldn't have made the film. That's and right. you don't need someone to give you a, a huge paycheck to then say, this is my calling card, this is what I'm doing. Like, you can enable yourself, but I think you're right, and I have noticed that uh, the stories at least at this very low level that I'm at right now that are being told are being told by people with a certain level of privilege, and we'll see what happens. Well, the great thing is like, there's so much to be forgiven if the story's there. I mean, you'll, you'll forgive bad lighting, you'll forgive a shaky camera, you'll forgive like some bad editing, if there's a story there. And that's the good news, because the good news with that coupled with the technology that's really just about teaching yourself how to edit, how to shoot, like, you know, all of these things which are available to us now are just so like exciting to me. It's, I, I feel like it's like 20 years ago when there used to be, you know, when we were doing things so cheaply and just like, can I borrow that? I'll have it back for you in two months. You know, like, um, you know, and, and, and it's, there's something very, very exciting in the air right now. Um, but you have to be very smart about how it is and the story that, that you can't let the technology get out in front of you. You have to have that compelling story. If you're not a writer and you have a story, couple up with someone who does write and writes well. Um, you know, if it's something that you want to do, like, you know, learn how to make it happen. You know, and I think a lot of things really get stuck for a while. Um, and and they get stuck often, and we get told no, sometimes simply because it's not good enough. You know, there's a possibility of that as well. A uh, question right here. Um, yeah, so this is a little bit of like a queer theory question, and it's a question about um, like what you think about the difference between a queer representation as opposed to like a representation of a queer person. Like when thinking about the future of queer filmmaking or you know queer cinema like do you think about like a non-narrative form or some kind of I don't know what do you think about this idea of like a queer representation as opposed to as within the genre of queer cinema as opposed to like representing can you throw making, out examples make, for us like making visible the lives and the existence of LGBTQ people as opposed to like something that you might interpret I'm asking you as sort of creative people right who've dedicated your lives to this kind of creative process like what do you think about 
the concept of a queer representation. I don't know, it's, it's open to interpretation. So the question is, is a little bit of kind of coming place of queer theory, uh, that your thoughts on the difference between queer representation or representing uh, queer people and LGBT people, is that right? And um, you know, what, what are your thoughts about the future of, of LGBT cinema, um, different genres perhaps? Um, is that like a blue is the warmest color reference? Oh, maybe. I'm curious. No, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, to but maybe, maybe you're onto something. Like, you know, lately we've been like consuming like mad Game of Thrones, which doesn't really feel all that queer unless all the male love is queer. But then we'll look at like Orange is the New Black, and then we'll look at like Orphan Black, and I'm just like, oh, we're in like a really female upon female upon female space. You know what I mean? Like we've got one amazing actress playing all these parts of herself on the same screen, dancing with herself. <laughs> And something about that, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm like, it's kind of really queer. Do you know what I mean? It just feels like it. I'm in a, a, a world where different things can happen, where gender and sexual identity, not maybe not, yeah, she's, her gender, her sexual identity, her whole identity is kind of fluid, and I guess that's kind of exciting to me, because like I'm writing this butch femme romantic sex comedy, and I'm thinking it has to kind of, in its DNA, be kind of queer-ish. So I wonder if that's part of what you're getting at. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I think that there's, and I think that this is what often gets overlooked when, when uh, a queer filmmaker makes work that doesn't have overt queer content, I think the film is still queer. I look at a Todd Haynes, I look at Mildred Pierce, and I'm just like, that's queer. Or I look at any, like a lot of his work, for example. And often, I think when we, we, we feel neglected by, and again, it goes back to the audience, I think the audience feels let down that there's not overt queer content when I think that there is. There, if there's, if there's a unique perspective that one has, um, depending on when they were born, what they grew up with, like, you know, and, and, and being queer absolutely is part of that. And I think that that comes through in ways that we often don't appreciate as people who want to see queer work. By, and then I also think there's a co-opting of, of, of sort of LGBT, and I think that we're looking, I think that we're on the precipice of seeing a lot of T, um, uh, of the T and all of that being sort of co-opted by mainstream television. I think you're gonna start to see a lot of, uh, a lot of trans uh, characters that are gonna start to pop up, and that's gonna be a real, um, that's gonna be a little challenging, I think, because I think that there, I don't think that there are people um, I think that they're writing out of a fascination and not really out of a place of community. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. But but because it's it's like sort of like oh I've just discovered this I just like read this family, article. Like a, like Is it a little exotic? Do you think um, it's kind of like it's loud and noisy and that's why they're going for yeah, it? Yeah, it's like it's like references to Molly right now. You know, like it's like, you know like it, it's like it's just what I just read in a news feed or it's like what I you know like there were a couple there was an ABC there was like a Nightline with a with a young uh, trans person, and um, uh, and and um, and I think that like a lot of people will look to those things to be like, I want to be the first person to put that on. Yeah, yeah, and and it's already become. And then it, it, do you remember the moment that almost every single like cable show had a young gay son? Like it was that. Like you know what I mean? Like it was that moment that like you know, you're like you're like oh my god, every Showtime show has a, has the the son is gay on every single like five of these or something. And it, you know, and it's sort of so that's kind of interesting how those things happen, uh, because someone wants to be a little more cutting edge, um, uh, and and that's it. Like the rest of it, mini or something. portray gender dysphoria is just so wrong that it's unwatchable. So the comment was that um, the trans community is very eager and wanting to see images of themselves on television and yet there's a lot of things that are put out there that are pretty unwatchable because they're so transphobic and, and hurtful. Well, fortunately, uh, Transparent's going to be coming out soon and that seems pretty incredible if we're going to go by the pilot and the people involved. So. I'm really excited for that show. Yeah. And she, she went out of her way to, you know, to, yeah. to, she's like, I'm going to have trans writers on the show. You know, like, I'm going to, yeah. I, I, you know, and that I thought was was, was great. And Andrews Berlin and Jill Soloway behind that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Should be a very exciting new series. 
Um, I thought I saw another hand pop up. Oh, hello in the front row with a Brooklyn shirt. seem like it was a failure. Uh, so can I read the question real quick? Oh, sure. Thank yeah, you, Karen. Um, so the question was going back to a point Rose had made about, you know, uh, reflecting on the early part of her career where uh, the projects were cast and crewed by friends and, you know, folks in the community. Um, and then, um, you know, the other side of, shall we say, the pendulum of where everyone is, you know, professional and being paid. Um, you know, what, what's what's the middle ground or what, what are what are your, everyone's thoughts on, on that or advice? Um, oh yeah, I'm sorry you were chatting, and then and then I I, I said I I think that I kind of skewed that a little bit uh, uh, negatively. It was amazing to be able to do go fish, for example, uh, uh, you know, like out out of the community. Like we literally were like, hey, you're cute and you're serving us food. Want to be in a movie? Like you know, I mean, that's kind of where that came out of, and and it was really and those those people became our friends for life, you know, um, uh, and. And that's that's a beautiful and wonderful thing, and I don't know with that narrative at that time, but but I I guess I just meant to say like know what you have and know that that's your choice that you could find a casting director and that you can make this thing and you can go down that path and you can say like you know what I don't want to deal with that actor I actually just wanted I do want to make this for my friend make it I, I be empowered enough and live in that skin enough to know that like I am like I am. A director, and I can, and this is me casting something. I um, so I've made a bunch of shorts, wrote and directed a bunch of shorts, and um, I feel like now in Los Angeles, in my forties, I have burned every bridge and asked for every favor <laughs> that people just don't want to. Well, first of all, everybody now, all of my peers are really successful, uh, and they're like, "Why would I do that for you for free when I get paid over here to do it?" Uh, so for me, it's I'm actually I, I think I just hit the point where I just worn out my welcome with the Los Angeles film community, lesbian film community. We'll have you up here, Gwen. Gwen here. We'll have you up here. Um, anyone else want to chime in on that? You no, know, I mean, I think what, what Rose is getting at is if your community and your friends are a great resource when you're first starting out, in particular because they have labor, and that's what you need. You know, you don't have a lot of cash and capital, and, and it's extraordinary because I think great stuff has come out of that you know, formation. Um, I was lucky with boys and that it was partly friends, but it was partly professional. And, you know, the interesting thing about an independent film is you're often, you know, you're, you need somebody to uh, be your camera assistant, but it's probably gonna be the person who was doing Dolly Grip last week. You need somebody to, you know, so basically you don't have enough money, but people are willing to give you their, their labor for less if you bump them up. So a lot of, uh, uh, an independent film is kind of half friend, half professional. And really that's where you have to be very smart because you have to be shrewd and say, is this person ready to push them into this place? Do I want them pushing the, the dolly? So I, I found a lot of that of how, how cheap can you go without suddenly the whole thing breaks apart? And I think that's a, you know, it's push, but you know, kind of just be aware of what you're putting together. I think like the main lesson that I keep hearing here and that I feel for myself as well is that you have to respect your time and your yourself and that you have to take I mean of course we all take it seriously but I think I was I used to be very apologetic and then this shift happened where I made the decision that I was the shit and that I was going to bring that to where I was going and not I mean obviously don't be an asshole don't uh, don't other people are the shit too but yeah there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that you know yeah like, you know, the number of times I just, as I said, I just did, it was so interesting to me to have just done this uh, thing that I did. And there were these, uh, I have a friend who, who appears younger than she is and, and who has older operators that she works with. And, and it is just amazing to me 
how much they second guess her, how much they second guessed me and the shots that I wanted. I'm just like, are you fucking kidding me right now? And that, and that now I will put them in their place. You Back the then, I would have said, I would have said sorry. I would have said, oh no, no, oh, okay, yeah, no, no, let's do it your way. You know, and it goes, you know, I mean, and that's just a lesson for, I think, you know, women and people in general who are, you know, who are marginalized. It's like, it's like, you know, you've earned that spot, you know, and so you need to exist in it because, you know, you make these films and, you know, sometimes you don't know if you're gonna make another one. You have to really make it, you have to be in the experience of it, make it count as much as possible. Because it's like, it's the same thing with the story. It's the same thing that whatever, you need to be the vehicle that gets that onto the screen. In a, in a way that's going to be compelling. Thank you for those thoughts. Uh, we have time for one more question. Oh, wow, you're going to make this hard on me. Um, let's go with the, the hat. <laughs> oh, I was just working, wondering, um, I want to thank you all. You've made work that's changed my life. Um, uh, but uh, my question is, I really like, uh, ironically, I like Tyler Perry as a filmmaker. And I was wondering, he's a he's an African-American Filmmaker who's commercialized a minority, you know, minority group. I'm wondering where is the lesbian Tyler Perry or the um, female Tyler Perry? I want to say I understand. I'm the female Tyler Perry. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I think Desiree and Kimberly might wrestle on that one. Waiting for me to come out and that's, right? I want to say, like, how do you commercialize lesbian? I mean, I guess we are doing it through frame lines, but how do you do it on that level? Like, with, like, the way Costumes. <laughs> I need a, a big suit, like a fat suit, a men's suit, something like that, and then no create a bunch suits. of characters. No fat suits. I, I think it goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning. You will get more when you go out and see more. If you don't, then you don't. And you know what I mean? It, you need to feed the beast. And if there's going to be someone, if it's going to be Kim Pierce who makes her <laughs> butch fed romantic comedy, yeah. and you go out in droves to see it, then guess who's going to be your next Tyler Perry? Right here. All right. I don't think it's going right. to be when they drink beer for breakfast, unfortunately. It might be. Yeah. It might be. Depressed 40 something. Playing both sexually roles. Crazy I, I like that Rose is, I like that we just keep coming back to Rose saying it's in your hands. <laughs> it's not about yeah, what we do. Responsibility. You're going to spend the money. Money. The decisions it are is. all money based. No, it, it, but it is about support for. Look, hopefully we make good work, but hopefully our audiences show up and you know support it. Yeah. Well, we can't thank you enough for all of your your talents, your insights, your work. Um, thank you for inspiring us, for uh, making us laugh, for turning us on, for making us cry, uh, for being with us during the festival. Thank you, audience. <laughs> Thank you again for being here, and um, please everybody come out tomorrow night to see uh, Desiree's feature debut. Yes. So Thank great. you so much.